like to introduce you to uh, Professor Griff on behalf of the Office of Multicultural Affairs for this event for Black History Month. My name is Carla Um Today we have speaking for us Professor Griff, who's an internationally renowned educator, writer, producer, musician, platinum record and spoken word artist, lecturer, and founding member of the pioneering and revolution, revolution, <coughs> revolutionary hip hop group, Public Enemy. Armed with an exemplary life of service and an impressive 20-year musical career, Griff captivates with his universal call for social responsibility in the, within both the hip-hop community and the larger culture. Griff skillfully customizes this extensively documented lecture to suit the needs of all audiences, so please help me in welcoming our guest, Professor Griff. Let's give her a round of applause for that introduction. <laughs> Carla, right? Okay. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Good. All right, y'all can do a little bit better than that. I was. Good. All right, hold on. One. Okay. Um, I told a few people that I would be here at East uh, Tennessee State, and um, I told them I was coming to Johnson City. Is that correct? So, you know, some people were just like, where? <laughs> so. But um, I'm glad to be here, so um, thank you very much for the, um, the invitation. Um, by show of hands, how many people have actually went through the museum and checked out the exhibit there? That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So during the q and I'd like to ask you some questions about what y'all thought. Is that cool? Is that all right with everyone? I'm hearing like two people. Is that cool? Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, I have to personally thank the, uh, the faculty and the staff um, being so warm and hospitable. Um, it's not like I get tension everywhere I go, but being Professor Griff, there's just a little bit of turbulence. I'm sure you'll understand that. But um, I want to thank um, Khaled El Hakim for uh, inviting me in to be a part of his life work. Let's give him a round of applause. Um, I think when I was invited in, been now five years. Um, he's been collecting for 20 years. And when I was invited in, I didn't see it as though I was hooking up with someone to kind of travel around the country in rain, hail, snow, and earthquakes just to, you know, just for the sake of traveling. Um, part of what he is doing or what I'm doing with him is actually part of, you know, my life work. Um, I'm not just saying that to fill up space in my introduction. You know, I truly mean that. Um, when I was invited in, he, uh, we had you know, a few talks and we basically came to the conclusion that since young people will not go to the museum, we'll bring the museum to young people. Um, I don't know if you know the, uh, the, uh, the history of how he put it together. It was young people in the community that got together that gutted out a trailer that actually painted and hammered nails and fixed it up to the point where he hooks it up to the back of his car or to a truck and we were bringing it to the campuses. How many people knew that? So this is a labor of love um, and not to mention that I think um, um, if we had no college campus or no high school to bring it to, we'd probably have to set it up on a street corner. Am I right or wrong? Because it's about raising the conscious level of the human family. Um, the valuable pieces that he's labored so hard to collect. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's very difficult. You may see how many pieces you have out. 200 pieces out of 1,500 pieces. Every piece uh, was a labor, meaning that he had to find it. It's not going to come to you. I'm talking about some of the backwoods places in butt scratch Louisiana we had to go <laughs> in somebody's basement to find some. You ever see the movie Silence of the Lambs? <laughs> well, some of them places we had to go to find some of the pieces. So um, if nothing else, um, you know, we, we just need to at least, you know, look at every piece and just use that as parts and pieces to a puzzle that have yet been untold. But the key is you have to finish telling the story. Are you following me? 
following me? Okay, I think it was, um, no, no, Franz Fanon, who said, uh, out of relative obscurity, each generation must discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. And it's truly up to you. What you have to do is use what Khaled is presenting today as a point of reference. Um, we may walk through and spend two or three minutes and look at the things as though it's entertainment. Not the case. I think Malcolm said, uh, history is uh, most attractive uh, and rewards all of our research. So if we know what was, we know what is, and we know what's to come. And we need these parts of our particular um, history to kind of fill in the blanks, because I don't know about you guys, I didn't get it in high school. How many of you got it in high school? Not too many. All right. So um, with that as a backdrop, I think we owe one more round of applause to Khaled El Akim. Um, let's give him another well-deserved round of applause. Um, yeah, I was there at the uh, conference when y'all met. I don't know where I was when y'all kind of hooked up to come to, um, where was I at, man? Oh, okay. <laughs> but um, it's always a good thing to know that the conference actually works this time. I mean, because I've been going to conference for five years with you. And um, a lot of times when you're not invited, you don't think the process worked. But this is, um, today we can honestly say that the process worked. Someone is actually looking out for your health and your welfare and your extended education, um, even when you're not, even when you're struggling through classes that you're probably uh, are trying to get through. Someone is out there at the conferences looking to further your education outside of these four walls. So um, once again, thank you all very much for having me. So I think at this point, I think I need to do a disclaimer. <laughs> not that we're going to get into anything kind of controversial, but we might. No, I got it. I'm good. Um, I'm going to talk about the exhibit. I'm going to talk about black history. I'm going to talk about history um, in, from a um, hip hop perspective on what it means to us in 2011. But I think a little bit later on in the lecture when we dive into um, hip hop, I think we, we need to get a basic fundamental working definition of what hip hop is before we go into it. Now if I ask by a show of hands to ask you to define hip hop, to me being 50 years old, coming through the golden era of hip hop, we'd probably come up with about four or five different definitions. Am I right or wrong? Okay. Just as a taste test, let me just throw this out there. Who knows the fifth element of hip hop? Was that, you scratching your head or you just, okay, you counting, he's just counting, okay. Anyone? See, now you're about to make my job very difficult because now I got to explain the four fundamental elements of hip hop, synthesize it with this fifth element, marry that on to black history, and bring it up to date in 2011, and that's kind of difficult. So I'm gonna need your help, is that cool? Is that all right with everyone? All right, cool. So what I think I'm going to do is, um, just kind of basically read some, some quotes to see if we can just kind of set the tone. I'm going to deal with some theory. Um, it may sound like a conspiracy theory to some of you guys, but if you're actually living it and it's happening right before your eyes, um, I would tend to believe that it's not only a conspiracy, simply meaning someone conspired and got together to bring about a certain result. Um, but when I started to see these things in hip hop, it started to trouble me. Um, when I started pointing out the organizations um, that was responsible for dumbing down the music industry, for dumbing down hip hop, I started to point them out. Um, normally I would have my DVDs laid out on the table and in essence, thank you, in essence this is how it, it, it went down. My DVDs would be on the table, young people would get them, go chop them up, put them up on YouTube, and I would end up getting 100,000 phone calls in a month, which is very critical. Surprisingly enough, one or two of the, uh, the lectures that I've done had my phone number, and somebody put it on the internet. So can you imagine? 
my phone number going out on Worldstar and end up getting um, 750,000 hits. So now that 200 clips are up on YouTube, can you imagine the phone calls that I get? Now listen, I don't mind. It's just that I do mind the 3.30 calls in the morning, breathing hard on the phone, threatening me. That kind of stuff I do mind. Are you following me? So, um, all right, one last thing. Is there anyone in the audience working for the government? As agents, as you working for the government? Okay, that's cool. You safe. Anyone else? <laughs> That's where you're headed. We need to talk to you a little bit later on then. We need someone on the inside, all right? Okay, she's looking at me like, yeah, all right. All right, let me pull this back up so we can kind of um, get started. I'm not going to be able to go over every slide. This slide was originally a lecture that I was doing in, um, uh, in Kentucky. And um, I was preparing it for two other lectures, which a few of them have gotten canceled. So y'all don't mind if I just kind of run through some things real quick. All right, um, just by a show of hands, how many people actively participate in this thing that was given to us by Carter G. Woodson as Black History Month, which started out as Negro History Week? Okay, let's just set the ground rules. This don't count, all right? So if you're gonna raise your hand, raise your hand. Okay, so everyone else with your hand not up, you just kind of, the little 28 days that they give us just kind of gets by you? Do you need some instructions, kind of like a map, road map, so a lesson plan? Uh, the people that had their hand up, I think it's our duty and our responsibility that each one should teach three. If everyone that had their hand up did so, then everyone would be able to participate in a month that our people have sacrificed at least for the 28 days that we get. Are you following me? And even if it's the coldest month of the year, we should take it and use it to our best advantage. What do I mean by that? We could celebrate all of the engineers and the authors. We could, in, we could celebrate all of the people that laid out their life to see that we made it to 2011. Are you following me? So if we was to pour a libation, right, by a show of hands, who do you think we should mention in these 28 days that we're given? We already mentioned and celebrate the life of um, Malcolm X, right, with, with the exhibit. Um, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, um, Muhammad Ali, who else do we have on the table? Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey, who gave us, where's my pen, the red, the black, and the green. Um, and in asking young people, what is the significance of the red, black, and green? You see, we have to notice verbatim. So when we meet students of other different nationalities um, and ethnic groups, we can have that conversation in the hallways and let them know that Marcus Garvey, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, with the UNIA, gave us that flag as a, li a liberation flag for our people. And the red symbolizes the blood that was spilled. The black is for the people, and the green is for the land, the motherland, all right? Now, mind you, um, coming right after him was the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, who said that the earth is our home. We just use Africa as our throne. Are you following me? So this is a basic conversation that we should be having. But I'm sure that if you stop anyone that was of Irish descent in the hallway, they'd give you a rundown in the history of not only their flag, but their country and the history. Are you following me? The same with Jews and Italians and Mexicans and everyone else. Are you following me? All right, we're no different. We have to do this. All right? Are you following me? All right, that's cool. Now, pardon me? Right, this, I was about to get to that. So. We could talk about Fred Hampton, we could talk about the Black Panther Party, we can talk about all of the, the conscious era of hip hop that got us to this point. So just as a small exercise, who, would you, who do you know that you could mention to someone of a different race that you could have a conversation in a hallway with them to let them know about Black History Month? By a show of hands, who would you mention? Yes, sir. Nat Why Nat Turner? Or, 
Oh, okay. Who else? Yes, ma'am. Pardon me? Rosa Park. And why Rosa Park? She stood up for her rights. Who else? Somebody else. Come on. I need one more person to round it off just to balance it out. Yes, ma'am. Huey Newton. Why Huey Newton? Okay, let's give them a round of applause. What I'm going to attempt to do today is give you Professor Griff's perspective from the inside out in dealing with how I approach culture, history, especially black history, how I'm approaching the subculture called hip hop, and I'm giving it to you from an insider's perspective. Um, meaning that I didn't read this on a bumper sticker. All right, and I didn't read this on someone's t-shirt as I was passing by, all right? So when you kind of live these things, you kinda, I'm kind of giving it to you from an insider's perspective to let you know in most cases what goes on behind the scenes, um, not only in entertainment and in uh, popular culture, but in hip hop as I know it. This is why I entitled, uh, the subtitle is It's Bigger Than Hip Hop, It's Beyond Beats and Rhymes. Now, um, hip hop. Hip hop is higher infinite power healing our people, all right? Higher infinite power healing our people. Why? Because we always use music um, in rituals. We always use music in festivals because we thought and think today, still today, that music has a healing power to it. This is why when you find people that operate in dealing with alternative medicines, aromatherapy, Music serves as uh, methods of healing. It aligns the chakra, uh, aligns the chakras, which are the energy centers. Um, it brings them in line and connects them with your aura. We'll deal with some basic metaphysics a little bit later on, but hip hop is high infinite power healing our people. What we're about to go over and talk about is some basic things that I feel from my perspective is beyond beats and rhymes. I'm going to skip over a lot of the slides simply because I want to get right to the point and we don't um, have a lot of time. Um, back in the day when I was growing up, when we had the experience of going to the store when we heard that a new album came out, we had the experience of going to the store and buying it. Once we bought it, we resonated with it because we looked at the covers. We read the credits. Are you following me? And this became part of our knowledge and our experience um, with uh, a new record coming out. Especially if it was our favorite artist, we wanted to know everything about the artist. In today's uh, fast-paced world that a lot of you live in with iPads and um, what else, eye condoms and eye whatever else, with supersized malls and supersizing everything else, are you following me? We rarely take time and spend time um, reading and becoming part of not only being a fan, which is the root word to fantastic, which is the root word to fantasy, and this is exactly what they want you to do. They want you to buy in to the fantasy so from a young age you become a perpetual consumer of what you think is uh, music based on a tradition and a culture. But today I beg to differ. And we have to understand that hip hop and rap are two different things, all right? Hip hop is something that you are, rap is something that you do. I'm gonna let you marinate on that for a minute. Because I hear a lot of people talking about rap and they blame hip hop. If we had an umbrella and the umbrella served as hip hop culture, up under the umbrella of hip hop culture, you have MCing, rapping, breaking, DJing, and graph writing, graffiti. Rapping and MCing is only one aspect of it. Then to synthesize that we have the knowledge of self, what brings it all together to understand the four fundamental elements of hip hop. The four fundamental elements of hip hop are tied into the four fundamental elements of the universe earth, air, fire, and water. So there's a spiritual component to hip hop that we always leave out. We hear a song like Laffy Taffy and listen to it and say, I don't like hip hop. 
And then we, we end up leaving out the three of the other elements and we fall short. Are you following me? Okay, let's understand that. So when we purchased the album, you know, we digest and studied the cover. This is my album that just came out um, two weeks ago. It's entitled The God Damage. So we study the albums, and in most cases, we tack them on our walls. I don't know if you used to do that. They became part of, of what we were about. They spoke for us. Are you following me? Like back in the day when hip-hop first came on the scene, and we were carrying those heavy boxes around with them heavy, expensive, D-sized batteries. I don't know if you all remember that. But anyway, when we put it down, and we stood in our B-boy stage, whatever song was on represented us. Are you following me? So hip-hop served as a voice of the voiceless. And that's, what it, and that's what it meant to us. So when I managed to put together my book, Analytics, 20 years of conversations and interviews with Public Enemies Minister of Information, Professor Griff, analytics basically simply means critical thought, critical thinking. And that's what I invited people to do. Let's not look at hip-hop as just one aspect, meaning emceeing and entertainment. It's a deeper component to hip-hop on the spiritual realm that we keep leaving out, and we miss the boat, all right? The book that I was putting together is entitled The Psychological Covert War on Hip-Hop. Inside of this book was this particular chapter entitled The Metaphysical Goddessry of the Soul of Hip-Hop, which we're going to talk on some metaphysics in a minute. But what I had to do is take this particular chapter out because I deemed it very necessary to, um, to lend credence to the fact that we need to start loving, honoring, and respecting women, especially in popular culture. Are you following me? Especially in hip hop. What I decided to do, as Sister Ra teaches us, that we should put the woman back on the throne in hip hop so we can balance it out. And I think this is what's going on. There's too much testosterone running wild in hip hop, and all we're hearing is music and perspectives um, that are very linear coming from a, a male point of view. Are you following me? Then any time that we hear something coming from a woman's point of view, it's on a low vibration. Are you following me? It's from the Nicki Minaj's and these kind of characters. Now, I know you're probably a Nicki Minaj fan, but let me just give you my take on it. I watched the behind-the-scenes um, MTV thing that they did on Nicki Minaj, and I sat there in shock to know that she, she said she would only deal with women. And the fact that she mentioned that there's a demonic entity that lives within, with, inside of her. How many people have heard this? No one, just me. I guess I'm the only one that heard this. Okay. <laughs> Nicki Minaj says there's a demonic entity that lives inside of her, and she gave it a name. She says it's a male entity that's very violent and uncontrollable. She calls him Roman. I called it demonic possession. Are you following me? And this is what I mentioned several years ago when I talked about Beyonce oftentimes morphing herself into this demonic character called Sasha Fierce. Have you ever heard of this character? Okay. Well, by her own admission, she says this character takes over. All right. And in studying the voodoo, in studying ancient mystic practices, we know what that is. That's demonic possession. All right? So let's push forward. So I had to talk about the metaphysical goddessry of the soul of hip-hop to add the spiritual component back to hip-hop so we can be well-rounded. All right? So when I move later on into the psychological covert war on hip-hop, we would understand. So I have to talk about um, destroying hip-hop's appetite for self-destruction. I have to talk about the Illuminati's takeover of hip-hop. Now let's just not get really too moved by the term Illuminati. I hear that being thrown around in the music industry and on YouTube. The Illuminati simply means holders of the light. All right? The light bearers. Listen, I think I need to say this from the out start. You cannot join the Illuminati. Someone came up to me at the grocery store and said, their homeboy was about to join the Illuminati. Stop that. The Illuminati is a secret society with subsidiaries that go by a lot of different names. And the only reason why I'm going into this, 
because I have to use this as a backdrop because I know it's on a few people's minds in the audience. All right, we're throwing this term around and we're acting, it's like, acting like it's a glee club or, or the Boy Scouts, which is not the case. It's an ultra secret society. All right, started back in the 1800s and you have to understand it. You're just not gonna walk up in there and say, here I am, it doesn't work that way. They don't, you don't choose them, they choose you. And if by chance you're chosen to be a part of one of the subsidiaries of the, uh, or the subgroups of the Illuminati, good luck. Are you following me? So we have to understand this thing and put it in its proper perspective. Someone's coming out with an Illuminati mixtape. What kind of madness is that? Illuminati clothing line and this kind of madness. So we need to keep things in its proper perspective. What I'm attempting to do today is kind of demystify it. All right, so we can get a better understanding of what this is and what's going on inside of uh, the music and popular culture today. Um, simply put, we need our history and our history told by us to us. All right? If we're going to tell the history of black people's sojourn, not only in America, but coming 9,000 miles in the holes of ships, all right, being brought to America through the Caribbean islands up into America and dehumanized, robbed of a name, language, culture, God and religion. That story, and even the story of what we went through on the African continent and the glorious history of black people from pre-dynastic Kemet, which you call Egypt, all through the dynasties, right on up to the time that we was colonized and enslaved and put in the holes of ships and brought to America. That story needs to be told to us by us. Are you following me? And there's nothing wrong with other people of other complexions coming to tell the story, but let's just get the facts correct. Are you following me? And we definitely have to check it, simply because every time I come to a college campus or have a discussion with young people and I ask them to talk to me about, about black history, we always start with slavery, as though we've done nothing else. All right, so let's dispel that and stop telling me that slaves were brought over from Africa. That is not correct. Proud black men and women who are kings and queens and gods and goddesses were put in holes, put in the holes of ship and brought to America and made slaves. Are you following me? So let's get it correct. All right? Now, Elijah Muhammad said it would be very difficult to free the minds of our people using this bastard language called English, and I'm not being vulgar or foul. All right? So even speaking to you right now, I have to speak and use a language that we're, that's alien to the very uh, fiber of who and what we are. Are you following me? Let's push forward. We're going to skip over a lot of things that we don't need to go over because they're kind of elementary, all right? Some things that you should kind of know already. We need to talk about the bridges that carried us over. What you're seeing in Khalid El Akim's collection and his exhibit in the next room is part of what I call the bridges that got us over. Now listen, we don't necessarily have to agree with the bridge. How many of you have ever driven out of state and you had to cross some bridges in order to get to the next state or to the next town? Did you get to the other side and turn around and curse the bridge out? No? These are bridges that got us across. These are doorways that allowed us passageway to the next realm. So even when we talk about Malcolm X, you may not agree with everything Malcolm was about. No one's asking you to. But as black people, is that not a period in time and a history that we need to hold on to, know and understand? Can we not use that as a bridge or a doorway that got us through? Can we? Can we use what Harriet Tubman taught us? When she was interviewed, she was asked, how many slaves did she free? She said she's freed thousands, but she probably would have freed thousands more if they only knew they were slaves. But nonetheless, is it a bridge that got us across? Yes, it is. I don't agree with everything that go down in the black church. But the black church served as a beacon light to us, right or wrong. And it's a bridge that got us over troubled water. Even when I'm sitting across from my opponent in playing chess or checkers. I'm not angry at the dude. <laughs> I'm playing basketball, I'm bringing it down court. I'm not angry at my opponent. I know I gotta get past them, right or wrong. 
Okay, y'all are very quiet, but anyway, just nod your head. 